to avoid fainting, keep repeating. It is only a movie. Only a movie. Only a movie. Movies are a very subjective art, but there are always a select few that become classics. Most of the time, they're undisputed classics for reason. But every now and then, they need to be re-examined and looked at through a newer lens. How long is long enough to break down a supposed classic into its parts and see what holds up, what doesn't, and what parts of the movie are just a sign of the times? Let's go against the grain and pull back the curtains on some bona fide classics and see if they hold up to the test of time. The Last House on the Left was released just over 50 years ago and is the brainchild of Friday the 13th and house creator Sean S. Cunningham as producer. And Freddy's father himself, Wes Craven, in the role of writer, director, and editor. And its biggest star was undoubtedly David Hess, who also composed all the music. Yeah, look it up. Who would go on to star in plenty of Italian knockoffs based on his character Krug. The movie also has Cobra Kai and Karate Kid villain Martin Cove. The movie follows a couple of fun-loving 17-year-olds, Mary Collingwood and her friend Phyllis, heading into the big city from their secluded mountain town to see a concert but not before looking to score some grass. Nah, I don't know that stuff. Unfortunately, they get tricked by the youngest member of a sadistic gang and end up trying to score their drugs from the wrong people. What follows is a harrowing journey that the audience follows with the girls, and sadly, it's not a happy ending for our heroines. Thankfully for the parents of young Mary, the gang ends up stranded and at their house. When the parents find out what happened, they show us that the criminals aren't the only ones in the movie that can get sadistic. An interesting side is that writer Ulla Isaacson is also credited as Craven made the movie a loose remake of Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring. Some movies are truly timeless, but most often they include references that may only make sense of the time or even actions that are just plain confusing, and Last House on the Left is no different. The first big sign of the times is the over-sexualization and nudity of a supposed teenager. Now, the actresses who play the two main teenage girls were actually 21 and 22 at the time the movie was made, but they both show full nudity over the course of the film. It starts off innocently enough right away with Mary getting out of the shower, with her breasts exposed. But it takes a much darker turn as the girls are eventually sexually assaulted by Krug and his gang. This is certainly attributed to both an independent production and the brain trust behind the movie going for as shocking a movie as possible. This probably flew under the radar as the film itself was released regionally, often playing on double or even triple bills with other exploitation movies. Hell, the original movie's title was going to be Sex Crime of the Century, so you'd have to expect a little shock to it. The movie also had to be cut down a fair bit to attain its R rating, which the producers wanted to be able to screen in more theaters and drive-ins. That sort of thing doesn't fly today, as even with characters on a show like Game of Thrones with actors who are well over 18 playing underage characters. The network is careful to not show nudity as the characters themselves are underage. Another sign of the times that is seen and heard throughout the entire film is the culture. This includes the language used, the music heard, the clothes and hairstyles worn, and even the vehicles that are driven. When we see throwback films of the 70s, the characters are typically driving a specific model that has been cleaned and shined to show off its cool factor. But you got that X factor. But every vehicle in Last House is clearly just what they had laying around. From the car the girls take into the city to the police vehicle the inept cops use, more on them later, the vehicles scream late 60s to early 70s in every way. The clothes and hairstyles go right along with this, even Mary's father giving her a peace sign necklace after joking with her about being part of the love generation. This is even preceded by dialogue which her dad chastises her for not wearing a bra. Of course not, nobody wears those anymore. Further pushing into the hippie free love era. All of the clothes worn by the principal cast are very dated by today's standards, but were absolutely the style at the time and go with the very early 70s hairstyle. I mean, look at the dad. Well, it's classic. How the characters and cars look are part of the equation, but the dialogue they use couldn't be more of its time if it tried. From things being far out, to buying weed being referred to as Score on some uh, good grass, do you? These lines don't appear as timeless as the creators probably figured they would, my personal favorite is when the girls ponder what making it with the band would be like after the concert is over. While there are plenty of other examples from the parents discussing what it must be like to be young at the time to the villainous gang's description and the ever popular request for the girls to make it with each other, 
The characters speaking to each other probably sounded normal to audiences in 1972, but at times might as well be speaking a different language to more modern audiences. Final Sign of the Times is something that will make complete sense to adults of a certain age. Growing up from the early 70s to late 90s as a kid, you could pretty much go anywhere. Hey mom and dad, I'm heading out with Jimmy. I'll be home at some point, I'm sure. You could play until the sun went down and then some without so much of a phone call or check-in. Sadly, that's exactly what leads to the main character's demise, and that's exactly why you don't see that sort of thing happen with this generation. The first thing that comes to mind of what holds up is the very thing the movie is known for. The tagline is to avoid fainting. Keep repeating, It is only a movie. Only a movie. Only a movie which coincidentally was used at least twice before this movie came out, but Wes Craven's brutal masterpiece is what it's known for. The violence inflicted on the girls is horrifying and unlike the movies that would follow it in the following decade, it isn't shown in a glorified or entertaining manner. Things like making Phyllis pee her pants and the girls have sex in front of the gang are uncomfortable at the very least and hard to watch at their worst. When the girls get away and you think they have a chance, they're dispatched with a brutal seriousness that even the gang's faces seem to be unsure of what they did. Even the violence taken out of revenge that should be consoling just feels hollow, angry, and sad. What's the violence without the characters involved, though? The characters, written by Craven and acting done by the performers, holds up well against contemporary films and by today's grindhouse standard. While the concert-going ladies, Mary's parents and even Krug and his gang have their moments of cheesy dialogue, they still all feel real. The denial parenting followed by concern and finally anguish of the parents will tug at the heartstrings of anyone watching that has kids. Mary and Phyllis might not have the most screen time but are sweet kids and you really root for them to make it out of their predicament before it's too late. Junior and Sadie may be the least threatening of the gang, but Sadie's excessive violence during the murder and Junior's guilty, pain screams at night give them both an additional dimension that could have been foregone for a less nuanced character. David Hess's Krug and Fred Lincoln's Weasel steal the show, however, as their insanity can be unending and unfeeling, like Krug or sudden and frightening like Weasel. Krug barely blinks when he forces his own son to shoot himself before going back to taunt and fight the father of the girl he murders hours prior. Finally, the overall bleakness and shock ending of Last House on the Left can't be ignored. The entire film you think that the girls may have a chance, or the bumbling cops, I promise we're getting to them. We'll find the gang and save the day, but there are no tomorrows for our girls and no honor or compassion in which they are abused or killed. Most scenes in the movie carry a heavy air that is still hard to watch after multiple viewings, and the ending fight is a gut punch. Even though you want revenge for the murdered girls, you can feel no release when the act is done. The parents stumble and cry as their girl is still and will always be gone, while even the cops are horrified by what they find at the last house on the left. Okay, finally the cops. While they seem genuinely concerned, their ineptitude for law enforcement is legendary within the history of horror movies. At some point, like a random dream sequence, they are clearly just part of the movie to be a time filler and how goofy their situation gets feels more out of place than anything. They would fit right in chasing Burt Reynolds' bandit or participating in the cannonball run, but while they bumble around, we have deadly serious scenes going on in what feels like a completely different movie. And since Ryan is out, thanks to you, you blame blame you. Going right alongside the Keystone Cops is the odd choice in musical accompaniment in some scenes. While the admittedly silly cops get into silly situations and therefore have silly music to go along with it, there are other times when the silly music just doesn't vibe with what we see. The girls are being taken out of the hotel and are being put in the back of a trunk to be taken god knows where and we get the dumbest sounding background music to go along with it. Most of the score sits fine with the rest of the movie, and while I enjoy the dichotomy of the serious scene backed up by the contrasting music, it falls flat here and is downright distracting. The only other parts that don't hold up great are the judo chop filled fight scene between Krug and Mary's father. Well, before the power tools are brought out anyway. I understand we had these types of things in the early James Bond films or the Adam West Batman TV show, but in a movie that makes its mark with shocking and brutal violence, 
This fight should have been a knockdown, drag out, slobber knocker. Instead, we have an attempt at a tense standoff that is completely forgotten when the chainsaw gets brought into the equation. A great example is when Sadie and the mom fight outside. It's ugly, it's quick, and it's natural before we get to the clumsy throat slashing of Sadie, courtesy of the mother. While the last house on the left has some out of place silliness to it, the filmmakers got done exactly what they set out to do. The horror and violence were absolutely shocking for 1972. And with how realistic and glamorous it is, it still holds up against most of the stylized violence today. Even its remake from 2009 has some fun effects, but doesn't have the balls to kill off all three of its younger characters with the youngest gang member and main girl Mary making it to the end credits. It's a movie that is often slept on, with most moviegoers choosing to enjoy Cunningham or Craven's popular and far less serious slasher series the two men helped create. But 50 years later, The Last House on the Left more than stands the test of time. Yeah.